Um, well, first of all, hello everyone and welcome to today's virtual discussion, Industry Insights with Bill Tesser, how to maximize your fix and flip ROI in today's market. My name is Jack Helfrich. I'm the SVP of Retail Lending over here at Civic and I'll be your co-host today. As the preferred private money lender for real estate investors, Civic goes further to provide our partners with relationships and information that other lenders simply do not. So whether it's accessing premium discounts at Home Depot, utilizing internal valuation services, relationships with Wedgwood's iBuyer platform, access to REO inventory, or an in intro to a top interior designer specialist, uh, Civic has you covered. So we're really excited to have uh, you here with us today. And we've got quite a fantastic lineup in store for you uh, with special guests, Justin Bruni and Darcy Kempton. Uh, Justin Bruni is the VP of Investments at Wedgwood Inc., where he manages investment uh, property acquisitions and flipping at scale. Uh, Darcy is the founder and principal of Simply Stunning Spaces and has been featured on HGTV's Flipper Flop for her expertise in design and staging that sells. So before I hand the mic over to Bill, uh, Gina Como uh, from our marketing team is here as the moderator and has a couple of quick housekeeping items to cover. Gina. Yeah, thanks Jack and welcome everybody. Um, first of all, just to get things started, a recording of today's meeting highlights will be available for anyone who's interested. So if you are, just send an email over to marketing at civicfs.com and we'll be happy to provide you with a recording link. Um, next, as you've all noticed, you've been muted upon entry of the meeting and that's just to help things moving, uh, you know, keep moving along here, but we want to hear from you. So use the chat feature. Um, it should be in the lower panel of your, of your Zoom uh, function, uh, you know, toolbar there. So use the chat panel to send over any questions that you may have for either Bill, Jack, Darcy, or Justin at any point during today's meeting. Um, we'll be answering your questions towards the end of the session today. And if for any reason we don't get to your specific questions, please know we'll be following up with you afterwards. And finally, Bill is continuing to host a series of his industry insights meetings um, during this time in effort to support and educate you um, during these uncertain times that we're going through. So make sure you don't miss out on any of his future meetings and the relative industry topics that we're bringing to you. So you can subscribe just to make sure you're not missing out if you go to civicfs.com slash industry dash insights. And lastly, we wanna see your faces. So I know by default, some of you may be turning off your cameras, but it's fun to see who's on the call and it's fun to really engage with you. So if you're in a place where you can turn on your camera, we would love to see you. Awesome, thank you, Gina. And now I'm pleased to introduce our host for today, uh, Bill Tesser. And Bill is our president and CEO at Civic, who has over 30 years of mortgage industry experience. And really, as the first private money lending executive to speak out after COVID-19, today he's going to share with uh, you all not only his expert industry insight, but that of Darcy and Justin's as well. So without further uh, ado, Bill, take it away. Thank you, Jack. I did notice an old friend on, uh, Nilu Ascari. She's showing us the, uh, the beach from Finance of America. So hello to Nilu. I haven't seen you in quite some time, but uh, it's good to see you on the call. Uh, I'm, I'm excited about today. Most of the Zoom calls we've been doing over the last uh, four months has really been in and centered around Civic, what's going on in, in, in the BPL and the conventional space and how that impacts uh, you as a, an investor. Today is a little bit different because we actually brought some experts in different aspects of that process. Uh, Jack mentioned a little bit, both Justin and Darcy. Uh, Justin and I go way back. Uh, we also uh, sit on a board. Our Civic's parent company is Wedgwood. Wedgwood is the uh, longest, largest 
fix and flip company in the nation. They have purchased, fixed up and flipped over 50,000 properties. Justin's been with uh, the Big W for 15 years, personally connected to over 10,000 transactions. He would correct me and say, it's not over 10,000 bill, it's 10,123, excuse me, 25, too close this morning. So congrats on Justin on that. But Thank you, Bill. Um, I asked Justin something I didn't know. I said, give me a fun fact, something I haven't known over the years. And, and he shared something with me last night that I thought I'd share with you. He said, uh, he, you know, he served. Thank you for your service in the Navy uh, and joined up for the rugby team because it was the only way he could figure out a way to get off the boat, the very boat that he signed up to serve. So he ended up getting off the boat. He was a smaller guy and uh, uh, ended up having a, a lifelong uh, stories and experiences by doing that. And I thought that was pretty cool. Um, also, and it'll be mentioned a couple times in here, he runs point at wedgewoodhomes.com. And, and really that was a solution that was set up when any of our investors, investors on this call, end up getting a little bit overloaded or over their skis in terms of what they have in front of them. And there's an opportunity to have your own personal eye buyer in your hip pocket that you could move some real estate to. So that's wedgewoodhomes.com. That'll come back on uh, later on. And then Darcy, uh, you know, in my time with Darcy, I kind of created a little slogan. It was, uh, she has an eye for what buyers buy. And if you haven't had a chance to go to her website, which is instantdreamhomes.com, do that. Um, it's by spending time on that, it's probably going to cost me thirty or forty thousand to change one of the rooms in my house. But the reality is, she really does have a different angle, and it's very current in terms of what people are interested in and what gets them um, off the couch to write a check and and move real estate. And so I, you know, she's 15 years in the design and staging site and, and she's gonna be a joy to have here today. Fun fact about her, uh, she's a lifelong grinder uh, out of college, uh, jumped in a U-Haul and sold art on the side of the road. So we could all appreciate that early grind and she's taken that and made that a, uh, that motivation into quite the business. So thank you, Justin, and thank you, Darcy, for joining. I thought before I get in with them, uh, literally in the last week, I've probably taken in over a hundred different personal emails or texts of, you know, what the heck happened during the pandemic, in the pandemic, as we're working our way through it. So I'm gonna take five minutes and just from a finance standpoint, let everyone know, and then we'll get into some Q and A with our, with our guest. Going into the, a pandemic, a lot of people saw a complete halt in investor um, lending. And, and for all the investors on this call, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This was not a credit crisis. They, I think early on, people tried to make it out to be that. I lived through the credit crisis. There's no comparison. This was a value of loan crisis, not a value of property crisis, but a value of loan crisis. You had a bunch of uh, institutional and non-institutional private money lenders that were doing loans. They were taking those loans and they were selling those to Wall Street. Those loans had a set value. And in a 48 hour period, that value was obliterated, totally obliterated, no fault of the borrower or the originator. Values were there, credit was there, liquidity was there, the plan was there, the experience was there, but there were no buyers. When there's no buyers and you have pools of loans, those loans have to move. What you saw happen, and this is really March, April, May, you saw 60 to 70% of the private money lenders stop lending completely, and, and most of those go out of business. They went out of business because the loans that they had already originated could not be sold at a dollar amount that could get them coal. Those pools of loans still exist on Wall Street right now and are still trying to be pushed at a discount. Then you had a, a group of lenders that paused lending while they tried to figure this out, raise more capital to keep their business going or, or sell those loans at a discount and live to play another day. And then you had a smaller group of lenders, Civic being one of them, that continued to lend uninterrupted. Part of that is you know, we have a big balance sheet, we have a strong capital base, we had pre-existent forward commitments. And, and listen, timing was everything. And, and we were fortunate that way. But 
don't make any mistakes, it did impact the space. It impacted it on leverages. For you borrowers out there, you know that you had to put more money down over the last few months. Rates went up, guidelines tightened. So, I mean, it wasn't really a good event for anyone, even those that continued to lend. As we go into the middle, and this is my truth, I, I think we're kind of in the middle, middle back of this pandemic. You're seeing some of those bad pools trade. You're seeing some of those lenders that were on the sideline slowly start to migrate back into the space. I, you've seen rates come down a little bit. You've seen leverages expand a little bit. Um, that's our truth today. And, and as I see us, when, when this pandemic gets in the rear view mirror, my truth is that this space is probably the strongest right now. There's still a, a desirous appetite on Wall Street to buy these, these pools of paper, which is good for you as investors. Having access to capital is key to everything. And so I see us coming out the fourth quarter, rates will get closer to where they were pre-pandemic, leverages will get closer to where they were pre-pandemic. And you know, I see sunshiny days. As it relates to conventional financing, non-investor financing, I spent 30 years on that side of the fence before I got into the private money side. And what I will tell you is today, rates are the lowest they've been in the history of lending. Not in the history of the pandemic, not in the history of the last four, in the history of lending. You can go get yourself interest rates in the high twos. There are seven, five, seven, and 10 one IOs that are trading in 2% range. So what, if you say to me, like, why is that important? Well, it's super important if you're a fix and flipper and you buy an asset and you fix it up and you want to sell it, you've opened the world up, a much bigger portion of the world to qualify for that asset. People who never thought they could own a home before now can. And, and there is many comparisons where it costs more money to rent than it does to buy with rates where they are today. So uh, if you don't, or you're not in alignment with a, uh, a, a private money or a conventional lender, you need to, and you need to get in, in touch with that person right now. Um, look, when I think about real estate investment, I, and I've done a whole bunch of fix and flips myself. I've been buying real estate for 30 years. So I'm just talking about from a personal experience, you got to identify the property, you got to acquire the property, you got to figure out your rehab and be sensitive about your hold times. You then have to market it and stage it and then hopefully sell it. And when all that's done, you have more at the end of the bone than you started with. That's kind of all of our goals, right? I think there's an awful lot that can go wrong and there's a lot that can go right. And so that kind of leads me into you, Justin, right? Um, if you don't mind unmuting real quick, 15 years experience. I already mentioned the 10,000 plus flips. Again, 10,100 and oh, 26 now. You just closed your third for the day. That's <laughs> under your belt. How are you approaching this market today? Whether you think it's pre, middle or the tail end of the pandemic, and how is that a little bit different than how you approached it, you know, before this became part of our life? Yes, it's a good question, Bill. I mean, before the pandemic, we were, we were running smooth, uh, you know, uh, putting about 40% of our deals in escrow each week uh, throughout the country. And uh, every area seemingly was, was moving very well. Uh, you know, then the, then the COVID happened, the shutdown happened, and we were absolutely freaking out. Like we were holding a big, you know, it's like, musical chairs when you're a kid and you know, everybody already sat down and we didn't have a chair and we we're sitting there going, what are we going to do? So we just kept putting one foot in front of the other. And it was so interesting that each week we kept putting deals in escrow first week of the pandemic, you know, it was, it was light. I mean, probably 15% of our deals went into escrow, but still 15% nonetheless. And each week thereafter, it kept building our confidence with the marketplace. Right. And, and our inventory spread across the country and it's uh, it mainly entry level. I mean, that's our big space. Right. And so what we, this, what we found was that the supply, there, there's still a general lack of supply for entry-level entry -level homes, and, uh, and that kept pushing it forward, you know? And so uh, people still need housing. Uh, you know, that, that fundamental shortage in housing just became that huge demand for us. And then you add in the fix and flip, the, the, the value adds, um, and we have our own design team on staff as well. And, and uh, you know, those fully remodeled assets as people during the pandemic, as they started 
you know, moving around a little bit, people that could with, with, you know, with the means and whatnot, um, they were looking for that, that perfect home that they didn't have to do anything to move right in fully designed house. And those have been trading very well for us as well. So, you know, going forward, we really like uh, where we're at. I mean, the, the entry level space is working very well. The, the value adds are working very well. And, uh, and, and it's, it's just still, you know, interesting to me that it's working. And Justin, how many, uh, how many properties did you have at the various stages of rehab or in escrow when the pan, let's just say the end of March, when we realized we were up against it? I would say probably about 1,200, if I'm not mistaken, somewhere around there, uh, 1,237. And I, I, I knew the answer to that question, but why I thought that was important for everyone on this call is I think anything about investing for all of us is about reference, right? If you've only done one, you have your reference of one. If you've done 10, you have that 100, you have a little bit more. But what Justin's talking about is at the time of the pandemic, it was north of a thousand transaction in various stages. So they got to watch the pace of contractors, the pace of marketing, the pace of staging, the pace of selling, the appetite of buyers, and then know how to pivot on that. So uh, you did end with design, and I think it's a good segue as I go into question number one for Darcy. Have, have you, has your perspective, Darcy, changed at all as we enter into COVID in terms of how we should be thinking about either the marketing or staging of our properties? And you're on, you're on thank you for unmuting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for COVID, like for us, we just see homeowners really like, obviously everyone's spending more time at home. And so home has become really important to them and their needs are changing. So, you know, a lot of people are working from home. They're educating their children from home. So they just, they need spaces in order to do that. And I think that's, you know, that's the biggest change. But yeah, things slowed down for a while. People didn't want anyone in their homes. And now it's just, it's exploded all you know all of our contractors are super busy we're really busy because people do have home as a priority now and um hey, so yeah and i think you yeah, met having them moving you mentioned something about the formal dining room right that most of your customers you come in and that is their new schoolyard and office so absolutely uh, yeah yeah, so I think when it comes to staging, if you've got an extra bedroom, setting that up as like a place where you can envision like, you know, homework and home office and, you know, definitely keeping that in mind. Is, um, do you cover this stuff in that online design center course that you, because you mentioned in our past conversation that you started this recently, is that mentioned in there? You covering all of this? Yeah, and we're constantly adding new modules, um, but yeah, in Instant Dream Home on instantdreamhome.com, yeah. It's our online decorating course. So we also set up a code for Civic. So you get a free virtual consultation with myself if you sign up today. Thank you for that. <laughs> You're welcome. Hey, Justin, quick question your way. Um, if you were to think of one, two, or three things that you're looking out for during this time to stay away from what I would call either a bad buy or a bad trade, anything you can share with the group? Yeah, I mean, it's always a, a good question, right? I mean, you know, everybody, everybody wants to buy winners, you know, um, but, uh, you know, as us, we do it at scale. I mean, you know, we, I tell my guys, if you're not losing, you're not trying hard enough as well, you know, to a certain degree, you know, everybody has their risk. But, you know, the, the, one of the biggest things I see people doing is they try to force a buy, right? Uh, they get their heart set on this house. They, they force, they, they, I, need, I need this house. And, and whether it's getting bid up or not, they, they pay a little too much for it perhaps. You know, then the next thing that ends up happening is they end up over rehabbing the asset, right? Um, that's a big, a big, you know, pain point as well. Like, hey, I need to, I, this thing's really messed up. I really need to spend more than I otherwise budgeted for in the beginning. And then you get at the end of it and you get a great product, but you have to sell it for so much more than the market's worth. And, you know, and you end up trading down a little bit. And then the third thing is, you know, probably holding it on for too long, right? Uh, holding on to it for too long. You know, especially right now, I mean, the, one of the great uh, um, comforts that I have about our inventory is that it moves so quickly, relatively speaking. You know, uh, uh, six months, you know, 180 days to 220 days is the sweet spot, you know, on, on a big moving ship like this for us. And, and what that does is it takes you out of the market dynamics uh, to a certain degree. 
Uh, people ask me often like, hey, what's gonna happen in two years? You know what, I don't really care what's gonna happen in two years because the inventory I'm gonna have in two years is gonna be bought six months before that two years, you know? So it, it, you kind of keep current a little bit. So I would say, I would say those things, you know. Um, I, um, I thought I'd share something with the group before I go to question number two, which is really the no-no question for you, Darcy. Um, we, one of the things I do at Civic is I offer uh, one-on-ones with any of our producers with top investors where I'll go out and I'll meet the investor and, and just really talk about their business and get to understand pain points and opportunities. And I, I had taken the time to go out to Arizona to meet one of our top investors out there. And he dealt in the one to $5 million price range in Arizona, moved about 15 assets a year, but really big ticket items. And one of the things he had done that I had not seen from an investor that size was he had renderings, marketing renderings of what the house was going to look like, both in signage and in a digital uh, experience via video where you could go through and see what that house would look like when he was done. And, and what that did was it fixed one of the things you just hit upon, Justin, and it was the holding time. So for him, if he could sell that asset before it was done, those holding times, it's all about, right, carrying costs and, and yes. capital relocation and all that stuff. So for all of you investors, whether you do one a year, a hundred a year, a thousand a year, these things matter. These are the difference between making money and losing money. And if you just tweak a few of your dials here and there, carrying costs, holding time being one of the biggest, it's the difference between winning and losing on a deal. And Darcy and I, you know, we talked about a stinker last night, right, Darcy, where, you know, it's easy to get emotionally involved in the transaction. And, and because of your skill set, you want to do things in an incredible way, but that takes longer time and it kind of outlasts the market. So with that, Darcy, tell me a couple no-nos of the way that you think about it when you're designing or staging a home today. A couple no-nos. Um, I mean, just lighting is so important. So natural light, you know, putting dimmers on everything. Um, so you definitely don't want to go dark. You don't want to paint all your rooms different colors. So just keeping things light and bright um, and um, not skimping on your kitchen. Like your kitchen is the heart of the home. That is what sells home. So that rule is like, like, I've actually been into houses where they put in new countertops, new backsplash, and then painted the old cabinets. And it was just like, I can't even <laughs> imagine that. Um, and, and I think, you know, right now, like don't delay on your purchases because there, you know, shipments are being delayed, materials are being delayed. So like, just get that ordered as soon as possible, have it on hand. Um, and ready for your, you know, your contractor so they have everything they need. Um, and don't skimp out on asking some advice from an interior designer because, you know, whatever they're charging, I think it's worth it. You know, they see things that you might not be seeing and they do know what's selling um, in your market. So, Liz Hillestad, our director of marketing, has, a, has a, a piece of real estate in Arizona that she's in the process of selling right now. She's actually in Arizona in the beautiful hundred. I think she said it was it was cool today at 109. Uh, but what you what she said, which Darcy just nodded to yesterday, was that someone in Darcy's position would tell you the cost you spend on staging could be greatly offset by that carrying cost or that price first price reduction you have because the house didn't show. In, in its best way. And I think that's something a lot of us here on the call probably don't put a lot of weight in to, right? Spend the money. I, I know that Justin, you, you, your team does that a lot more now, correct? Absolutely. And you know, a couple of things that Darcy pointed out that the shipping is a huge fact right now that we're having an issue with across the country. Uh, cabinets, for instance. I mean, you know, very well, well spoken there, Darcy. I mean, as soon as you know the kitchen that you're gonna do, order the cabinets straight away because the lead time, it's just the, the slow boat's not coming over as, as slow or quickly as it otherwise was previously, but also the designer influence. I remember when I first started doing this, I was out there in Las Vegas and, and you know, I like tan and brown and brown and tan and tan and brown and tan, you know, and I was selling properties. I, I, I knew what I was doing, you know, and then we created our Maverick uh, design internal uh, uh, design staff 
and, and they just opened my eyes up to so many different things. But not only that, they created a brand for us, but they were also putting our properties at the top of the market, reaching highs and uh, selling these properties at higher levels than we ever thought of. Uh, and Bill, to your point about the staging, I, I, I tell my guys all the time, you just dropped that price $5,000. Staging would have cost 3,700 bucks, you know, to, to get it. It, it just makes it look that much better when you stage a house from a, from a professional stager designer. Um, and it also covers up a lot of the, the screw ups that you might otherwise have or, or funky floor plans that you know, you, uh, you, you might have I'm not saying a, a big hole in the floor, you know, put a rug over it, but you know, the, Hey, this room's a little tight. Let me, let me put a smaller chair in it, you know? And, and so. Absolutely. Yeah. You're selling the vision and the lifestyle and people need to be able, people are very visual. So they want to be able to imagine themselves in the home. And yeah, I definitely a well-staged home will, will pay for itself for sure. So, hey, uh, Justin, trends right now. So real estate areas, you know, places to, not to, hot, cold markets. Everyone's got their own point of reference, right? And right. we swear by that. There's Inman and Chrisman and Wall Street and, and all these different uh, conferences and blogs that we follow. What are, you, what are you sensing right now? I know you're hot on South Dakota. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> Very hot on South Dakota, Bill. Thank you for that. Uh, as I sat there and thought about the, the audience who I'd be speaking to here, I realized that, gosh, these are a, everybody's a lot, you know, trying to buy the same house I'm trying to buy. So yes, Bill, South Dakota is the place to be. Uh, no, you know, in all seriousness, I mean, every market is different. And, uh, you know, we had a, a, you know, a little snafu in like an Oklahoma City, right? And uh, uh, Tulsa, where we went in there pretty, pretty hot, uh, felt the market, you know, I feel like we can do this in any, in any city in the country went in there, but there was some problems with that and that people were exiting uh, Oklahoma City. I read an article where they were like, hey, we're gonna pay you five grand to move to Oklahoma City. And I'm like, all right, that's it. If you're paying people to move here, we gotta go, you know? And uh, so each market uh, has their sub markets as well. And that's what I focus on the most, um, you know, because in, in LA there's, there's entry level and there's, you know, 15, $20 million houses, right? I mean, so how's the market in general, that entry level market, like I've been saying, is the is the sweet spot for us um, and f and find your niche right I mean if you like the million plus homes uh, uh, and and you have a good eye for that uh, you know believe in yourself uh, believe in what you're doing and and see it through and like Darcy was saying uh, to sort of one degree or another you know don't skimp out on what you're otherwise going to do see it through completely uh, and it'll get it but you know as far as the the trends that right now, the regions, I mean, we really, California, even though they're seemingly an exodus of, uh, of people, uh, you know, in, in every city that I'm in across the country, there's an article about California people leaving and going to that city in particular, right? I mean, and I'm, so I'm like, okay, well, they're not going to every city, you know, but California's got what nobody else has, the beautiful coastline and 40 million people. And it seems like whatever people are leaving, more people are moving right back in. And it's been super strong in, in California for us, um, you know, Florida, Texas, uh, uh, you know, even Arizona, um, all those areas. I mean, you know, it, like I said, pick your spot. Uh, the entry level is where we like right now uh, and, uh, and, and go all in. Awesome. Uh, Darcy, uh, you like, if you think about the whole fix and flip process, pandemic or no pandemic, when you think about design tips that sell, how, what would you share with the group? Well, the first thing I think about is um, who is the potential buyer? Who am I designing for and what are their needs? Uh, so that's the first thing, you know, and kind of looking at comps in the area and then creating a really open concept floor plan. It's just what people want today. Um, there's no more like people want like individual formal living rooms and spaces that they're not going to use. They want to use, especially in California, like um, people, you know, they want versatile spaces. Um, and like I said, beautiful kitchens, you know, remodeled bathrooms. They want um, just to feel light and airy and open for the most part. And um, yeah, you know, keep it neutral. Don't like test all your crazy fun design ideas on your first flip, I guess I would say. Darcy, that's a good point. Uh, I remember, you know, one of my, my property managers up in Idaho had uh, uh, did a, this unbelievable kitchen and the ugliest accent walls that I think I've ever seen that was so specific to, to one person, it was like, gosh, this is great, but ugh, this is terrible. And so that keeping it neutral, 
as best as possible with the with the trends absolutely is, is what I'm telling my people as well. Yeah. Hey, Gina, before we go into any chats or questions, you know, one thing I'd like to just share with everyone is that this isn't a lone wolf business. This is a business based on partnerships. There's nothing more important in each and every one of your own individual businesses than having alignment with partners. People, you know, our whole partnership for life, it's, it's something I've believed in my entire career in investing in the relationships other than just price and rate. Bring value to our investors in ways that no other lender will. So it doesn't become about that. It's, a, it's that partnership. And as I think about all of you on this call, right, have to have a good realtor on your side have to have a good designer on your side, have to have a good conventional lender on your side, have to have a good private money lender on your side, have to have a good general contractor. These are things you should slowly start thinking about because each and every one of those aspects are the differentiation between you guys making it or not making it in a transaction. And there is nothing more satisfying than taking dinged up real estate and making it a happy home for somebody. Nothing in the world. And Justin and Darcy will nod their heads up and down. And yes, we're all in this, right? We, you, you gotta get paid for your effort, but there's nothing personally more satisfying than taking something that's a bit tattered and beautifying it and, and putting a, a family in there that's gonna make it their home for the next 10, 20 or 30 years. And, and that's something that all of us should be proud about. So Gina, I wanna, um, give you the opportunity either through live chat, open up Q and A. Um, where are we? We're 932. So and we have a few moments to do that. And, and, and questions could be for any, uh, any one of us three. Absolutely. We have quite a few questions that have come in. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to get started with them. Um, the first one is for Darcy. Um, I've never staged any of my properties before, and honestly, I've been a bit nervous since I've never tried it. Can you do a brief walkthrough or overview for me of what the staging experience would be like? The staging experience uh, starts with a consultation with a local stager. They're gonna come into your home, kind of walk through, give you some general ideas, and um, then there's usually, a, you know, they're gonna put on like a monthly basis you pay monthly for um and it's usually like a you know a two to three month uh, minimum but every stage or you know they all work a little bit differently but i would definitely reach out to one or two look for the reviews online and just know that when you do stage like your the home is going to sell faster so even though i mean you just want to go into the project in the beginning knowing and having that staging on your budget because hands down you don't want it to like be one of those things that at the end, you're like, oh, I have, a, you know, I did go to my budget. Now I can stage it. It's like not negotiable for me. You know, that's what I would say. That's great. Awesome. Um, that's great. The, the next question is for Justin. And this is, this, is, this is a good one, Justin. Is the real estate market going to crash? When's the next crash? <laughs> well, define crash after this pandemic, right? I, I don't know. What it, good Lord. Uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, before the pandemic, people would ask me uh, often, like, you know, when was the, when was the, when's the next crash? When they would ask me, like, you know, when was the bottom of the market back after post the, the financial crisis? I would say it was August, uh, August 13th, 2011 or something like that. Well, I don't know if it's 13th or what the day was, but August 2011. And they're like, how do you know that? I'm like, well, got this sweetheart deal at the, at the foreclosure auction for basically 30 bucks a square foot for at that time, three-year-old properties, you know, and, and uh, pretty, pretty interesting. And so now fast forward to before the pandemic. And I, I felt like I was always saying, you know, short of a geopolitical event, I don't know that there's anything that's going to, to stop this, uh, this real estate market. Uh, the past, you know, 12 some odd years have been built on a paper loans and cash transactions, solid bedrock foundation uh, where it's not, before the, the financial crisis was built more on uh, irrational exuberance, uh, as everybody likes to say. Um, and, uh, you know, so looking forward now, uh, you know, I, I, I go back to, the, you know, the uh, economics class that I had in college that I had to take three times because, you know, a couple of cocktails back then here and there. And, uh, you know, it's, they kept saying supply and demand. And I didn't, you know, what are you talking about? The, the, the potato, the fish, the, you know, whatever. And, uh, you know, that's been the greatest thing for me right now to look at is supply and demand. So 
you know, and it's not just what's available on the, on the home market right now and your various MLSs and whatnot. It's the macro demand, the family creations, uh, the demand for housing. And, and right now it, it's, 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 it's slim. Land prices are super high. Nobody in any of the areas that I'm, I'm working in right now are building entry level homes. So you have that demand. And as long as that demand is there and the supply is weak, the prices are gonna stay stable. And so, you know, I, I say all that with the, the asterisks there, you know, short of getting shut down again, the entire country and, and, you know, throw your hands up. But other than that, I just keep putting one foot in front of the other uh, and, and keep going. The other thing that I would mention about that is, is for everybody on the call, sometimes people, I see people taking their money off the side, on the sidelines and just holding back, hey, I'm, I'm going to time this market. I'm going to do this. One of the great things, uh, uh, comforts that I have with our organization is that we have, we ha always have product. So what that means is that not only do we always have properties that are in the pipe in some fashion, uh, but we're always having, we always have properties for sale. So we know if we're not getting offers day one, you know, or we know if we're getting 10 offers day one, you know, and so that helps us understand the marketplace a lot better uh, by having that. So, you know, I know people do one or two or this, that, and the other, and, you know, and, and I understand times are, 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 are you know, people don't have the, the backing that we otherwise have, but, you know, I know that everybody has civic and, and gosh, our cost of funds at, at our place got up a little high. And I was actually asking Bill for loans on our properties, you know, and like, Hey, Bill, you're giving some great rates. Let's, you know, hook me up here. He's like, I don't know if we can do that, but uh, you know, always having a little bit of inventory in your, in your product so you can actually physically see what's going on in the marketplace. That'll help you guide yourself to your own conclusions about where the market's going. And then Gina, really off the back of what Justin said, here's what I, here, here's my truth. We almost hit 50 million people unemployed, right? The stock market went from 27,000 to 18,000. And we had about 50 unanswered questions regarding COVID. Four months later, there's been a lot more answers to what's going on. Not all the answers, but a lot more. The stock market is a couple hundred points off of its all time high and real estate values have held. If anything should have pulled the real estate market back and we all watched with bated breath, it's 50 million people that were unemployed. That should have been the big driving factor. So my truth is, as we get COVID in their, our rear view mirror and people get back to work and things start opening up, we could even have a surge. As crazy as that sounds, yeah. we, could have a, we could have another leg up, right? So I, I, think, there's, I think there's more opportunity than fear uh, because of what's already been in the market and the impact that that's had on real estate. And then just to put a bow on that, interest rates are 2%. So, yeah. I mean. Agree, agree. Gina? Okay, um, so for Justin, you, ha you have quite a few questions, but w one of them is, are you noticing a trend on smaller square feet or larger? As families may head towards having several generations under one roof due to COVID. Oh, that's a great question. And I think Darcy uh, answered that a little bit as well with, uh, with her design and saying that, hey, home is, is where people are spending the majority of their time right now, whether they want to or not, you know, um, it, it's, uh, and so, you know, she's designing her spaces to account for that. Uh, like, and Bill said with the, the conversation with the, the dining room, that's, that's, that's your schoolyard now, you know? And so to that end, I mean, uh, the smaller square footages are tough, but you know, when I look at smaller square footage properties, I try to comp like kind smaller square footage properties and also look to, what's available in the area, right? Uh, you know, where do, where do people go? I mean, sometimes people feel that pricing is linear on a price per square foot basis, but uh, I've, I've learned that, you know, famous last words, how do you mess up buying a 6,000 square foot house for $300,000? Well, I'll show you how, you know, nobody wants a 6,000 square foot house in Las Vegas that looks like a Cracker Jack box, you know? Um, so it, 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 it's definitely interesting. There's value add plays in some of the, uh, the higher density areas, like, uh, like, you know, California, for instance, uh, what are they called? The AUDs uh, or additional ADUs, additional dwelling units um, that people are adding square footage as a, as a matter of course, you buy a smaller property, uh, you got a little bit of land, slap an extra 400 square feet on there. And if, you know, things are selling for three, 400 bucks square foot, like, you know, you can do that and it makes sense. Um, so I think it's a little bit of both, but I think to what Darcy's point uh, about the, uh, the, the families living at home more often and staying at home more often, it's, uh, it's, it's helping that out. Yeah, the ADUs are a great point. Um, 
And then I would have a question about like the permitting process for those is at least over here in San Diego, it's really backed up. So people with plans to do that are getting delayed like indefinitely right now, you know, it's been months after months after months, but garage conversions, which, you know, can, you know, you're not adding the square footage, you're just converting it. So those are a little bit easier. Absolutely. Okay, great. So, so this one's for Darcy, when it comes to, when it comes to flipping on a budget, how do I know where to save and where to splurge? That is a great question. I always go bargain hunting. Um, I like to, you know, every dollar you save, like, you know, don't spend $5 a square foot on flooring if you can get it for three. So I always go and look for, you know, things that are being discontinued. And that's just a matter of literally asking the question, like go to your flooring store and ask them if they have any things that are being discontinued for us. It's, you know, we just call our sales reps up directly. And then once I have, you know, I can save a lot of money with my flooring selection and then I'll kind of build up from there. Um, we also save money on like with prefab bathroom vanities. So if you can find those online, they've already, it's going to save you on your fabrication costs for countertops. Um, and then we always splurge on fixtures. So those lighting fixtures, if you just spend a little extra, those are the things that are like the jewelry for the room that you can kind of tell if you skimped on. Darcy, you're absolutely right. I mean, it, it's amazing, you know, like we have our own design team, obviously, but it's, it, when you look at a property and you're comping properties out, you know, someone spent a ton of money, but there's no jewelry on the cabinets, right? There's no, there's no hardware. There's, the light, the, the, the fans are three different colors, you know, and that was one of my faults that I did back, back before we had designers as well. Oh, this fan's perfectly operational. I'll keep it. It's white. It's <laughs> over here. It's stainless steel. Right? That's yeah, keep your too. finishes the same. That's I'm saving money. Tip. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So great point. And for Bill, can, I've never used Civic Rehab financing before, and I feel like this would be a good opportunity. Can you tell me a little bit about Civic Rehab financing options? In terms of like guidelines around it, we'll go we'll go up to a hundred percent of the rehab. So. Uh, just keeping the, this question simple for everyone. If you wanted to borrow a hundred thousand dollars and we would loan you 75 on the acquisition and let's say it had $50,000 worth of rehab, we'd lend up to $50,000 for the rehab as part of the overall loan. And then we would just disperse as work progresses. Um, it, it, a lot of people don't understand that part, Gina and, and, and team that there is that rehab component because that, that really ends up becoming the differentiator of you entering into a transaction or not. Cause then you're really just thinking about your downstroke and you know, your lead on the build out and, and some small reserve. And it allows an awful lot of us to get involved in transactions that we otherwise didn't think we can get into. That's great, thank you. Uh, for Justin, um, it seems like people have moved away from large rehabs and have shifted back to cosmetic, lower mid-sized properties. Is Wedgwood following a similar model in acquiring new assets? And is there a standard threshold that a flipper should be aware as far as being too much rehab or work? No, that's a great question as well. I mean, you know, we, we're opportunists and we call ourselves opportunists because uh, it, it, we don't always fully rehab a house, right? If you have the opportunity to sell an asset quickly, you know, you understand that your annualized return on investment is higher, right? And, you know, and, and Bill, Bill brought up a good point about uh, everybody being partners with Civic. And I, and I feel that way as well in, in our space. I mean, we partner with wholesalers and, uh, and different buyers as well. And then there might be a deal with, hey, gosh, we just feel like we bit off more than we can chew. Um, you know, we don't, maybe we don't have the contractor base to, to cover this rehab. And we'll try to sell it to a wholesaler, maybe try to make a buck or, or take a smaller loss. Sometimes taking a smaller loss is better than uh, 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 trying to and, and end up, you know, lose now instead of lose later type of scenario. Um, so as far as the, the you know, what it's whatever the market is dictating, really. Um, some of these areas that where the value adds are, are uh, very prevalent, it's risky, right? Uh, you know, the, 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 the standard uh, as expected properties are selling in a range, call it like 350 or something like that. But the, the really dialed in properties, the, the designer influenced properties are selling for 450. Well, there's a big gap there, right? 
And so it's very easy. If you can sell it at that 350 price, you're not taking enough, that much time, uh, energy, effort, uh, or money to, to, to do so. And so sell it there if, if, you, if you're going to make the, the money. But if you, got, if you have to leg it out, that's very risky a little bit. And so you have to know, you know, you have to be confident in the, in the risk that you're otherwise taking. So it's, uh, it's, it's a mixed bag. And uh, to answer the question, we, we do everything. We do as expected, as is. Uh, um, you know, we had uh, kind of we have a customer service department in our, in our organization, and, and we got a call one time that someone was complaining that there was actually uh, 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 you know feces on the wall, and, and so that kind of made it through our 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 you know uh, customer service department. Like, oh, well, what's going on? Well, who who let this thing list? And we're like, you know, we put a lockbox on it, and it was as is, and. and falling down and we didn't want to do anything with it. And so sorry about it, you know, so we do that from all the way to, you know, brand new builds as well, where everything is, uh, uh, you know, from the ground up. So it's, it's a mixed bag. And just they, Darcy would tell you, whatever you do, make sure you clean the feces off the wall. That that's just not desirable, no matter how you're selling the property. I, Bill, I started telling that story and I couldn't stop. I, I was like, oh, it's probably not a good story to tell, but I just, I went with it. Sorry about that. But the other thing is that's interesting about the question is if you look at the big eye buyers, the real big, eye, the national eye buyers, the national eye buyers buy in a very small box, their mm -hmm. carpet, they keep their, their ranges down low. And something that many people on this call don't know is Wedgwood is actually one of the largest buyers for all the stuff that these big I buyers don't buy. So look at, they take in 30,000 opportunities a month and they may close on a thousand or 1500 because the other 29,000 are either too big of a CapEx uh, rehab or they're too big of a loan amount or they're outside of an area. And so I know you answered it already, Justin, but they're, they're not afraid of high CapEx deals if the numbers pencil. Right. Absolutely. 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 I mean, for us, it's, uh, you know, bring us your tired, your weak, your hungry. We'll, we'll take them all. And that's been one of the biggest uh, booms for us. As the, as you just explained, the eye buyers, uh, they're all in this little tiny box, you know, and, and, and they're, well, Hey gosh, that, that fits this box. Well, what about people here and here? And, and we've been very successful at trying to, to hit where they're not. Um, and, and those heavy CapEx reups, you just have to be confident in, in your support. And like Darcy had mentioned as well, you know, I see this with, with some of my buddies that try to do this. Well, they try to not use a designer. They think it's too expensive. Uh, uh, they think it's just a, a waste of time or, or you know, this, that, and the other. They can do it. And it, it's unbelievable how in front of the trends the designers actually are. And to Darcy's point, is, well, yes, this is $5 uh, a, a square foot. Well, hey, but you know what? This kind of looks the same, and, and this is two fifty. dollars You know, that's the thing that the people don't understand. Designers aren't there to spend money for you with, well, some are, I guess, you know what I mean? But the, they're there to make you the best deal and, and make you profitable because they know if you don't do well, then you're not going to use them again, you know? And so that, that heavy CapEx rehab, as long as you're, you know, have your arms around it, you have all the support that you need, the financing in place, uh, the game plan in place, the designer in place, and, and the contractor in place, then it's, you know, do anything. And that's how we feel across the country. That's great, Justin. Um, for, for Bill, there's a question about re financing using Civic as a, a re excuse me, a rehab financing only. So what if I already own the property free and clear and want to borrow rehab costs only? Is that something that Civic does? We don't do just rehab only. It would be part of one new loan. So rehab only almost sounds like a second trustee and we don't do seconds. But they could do, they could pay off their existing loan and as part of that new loan have a rehab component that would, would take out their existing financing. Yeah, to piggyback on Bill's comment, um, basically if it was free and clear, we'd actually give you $100,000 or our minimum loan amount, cash out, assuming it justifies based on the value. <clears throat> and then we'd actually hold back the remainder of the rehab as well. So you'd be getting cash into your pocket from day one and then uh, there would be a rehab holdback component to ensure that you have enough uh, to finish that project. Thank you, guys. Um, so bouncing around back to Darcy, um, someone has heard of having a memory point for each room, but isn't quite sure how to execute that. Do you have any ideas and what the significance or importance of that is when staging? 
Yeah, I, I consider memory points just something that's going to stand out for like when buyers are walking around, they're looking at all these different houses. Like if you've got something that they can remember the property by, and that could just be something as simple as just like a really unique pattern chair that was there, but you want to hit them on all of the senses too. So that, like the, you know, we, we remember like smells and things that we see as well. So like having candles burning or, you know, fresh baked cookies is like a trick that we use and diffusers with essential oils, like those little things that, that make it feel like home. Um, memory points, um, yeah, fresh flowers too, but um, just anything that's gonna kind of wow them. Like, oh, I remember that that bedroom that had the, you know, I don't even know what, <laughs> you know, just like little things that they can remember that are unusual. I don't have any off the top of my head right now. Darcy, no, I, I have one if I may. Uh, <laughs> yes. You know, we had, we had this uh, $4 million house in Vegas, but there's not a lot of those in Vegas. And we were doing a broker's open for it. And, you know, talking about a memory point, I wanted to get a giraffe in the backyard. Oh God, that's a good and one. <laughs> I feel like, hey, everybody would remember the giraffe, right? Well, I got vetoed, I, didn't, I didn't, wasn't allowed to do that. So I was a little disappointed, but to your point about memory points, I think that was, uh, that was my memory point. Mm, good one. That'll definitely be a good memory point. I don't think you can beat that, Dustin. Yeah. I, I, I wanted to draft. Darcy, you had you had in your on your website in one of your dining rooms like some 1920 images on the back side of the chairs, which I thought was awesome. Yeah. Yeah, those are memory like things like that that are unusual. Yeah. Those were yeah, that would be hard to find for staging pieces, but anything like that unusual would definitely stand out. And, and Darcy, for flips specifically, um, is there a good cost model for a min-max that a person should plan to spend on design and or staging, keeping in mind different geographical locations? Um. That's a, so for just an initial consultation, I would say your average is going to be anywhere from a hundred to four hundred dollars for a designer to um, like we meet virtually for you know for ninety nine dollars you can have a virtual consultation so you can take us through on FaceTime and we can take a look at the house with you um, just kind of let you know what I, our eyes are seeing and then um, beyond there I'm sure your local designers. Um, We'll do the same anywhere between 100 and 400 dollars for like a couple hours of their time and then beyond that they'll usually they work on a fixed fee basis or an hourly basis all right great thank you and for justin um with over 15 years working at wedgwood what have been the biggest learning points that you can pass on to investors who are looking to scale their business uh, that's a good question. Um, you know, I remember uh, first thought comes to mind of uh, back in the financial crisis and in, uh, you know, March of 07, I, I remember going to one of my, the senior partners of our organization and saying, you know, all lending stopped. We lost all escrows, right? I mean, it, you know, we were sitting there going, what's going on? What's we going to do? And I'm like, I, I go to them, I go, hey, what happens if they never, if they never lend again? You know, like they being the big banks and they, what if nobody ever lends a loan? And he goes, you know, pass me on the head a little bit and goes, you know, lending is the oldest form of return ever in life and, and will be, you know, someone will fill that void very, very quickly, right? And quickly it was, I mean, maybe it was a couple of years, you know, as it kind of kind of started to grow. So, you know, be confident in the, uh, uh, you know, to your question about how to, how to grow that, how to scale it, you know, be confident in, gosh, I would say the United States of America almost, right? I mean, that's where we're at. And it's, it starts there. I mean, the confidence is, is, is there and the, the infrastructures that, the country otherwise has. And then from there, you know, you can put one front in front of the other when the bottom falls out of the market, you know, and you can keep investing, you can keep uh, uh, putting your, yourself out there and, uh, and growing your business and taking advantage of opportunities as they, as they do. One of the greatest things for, for Wedgwood uh, that we did was we paid off all our debt in 06. You know, that wasn't my call. I was young, young in the tooth and I'm sitting there going, gosh, I can buy all these deals. What are we doing? And ended up paying off all our debt. And so we're sitting very pretty in, in come 07 uh, and, and 08, 09. No. So you take advantage of those once in a lifetime opportunities 
um, that, you know, this is one right now as well. So. Yeah, Gina, I would just add to that is, uh, you know, I said it earlier, but I think partnerships are everything. There's yeah. go back to my first question. There's so many things that can go wrong. There's also a lot of things that can go right. And just in your own time, sitting back and thinking about all the different people and things that touch your transaction from the beginning of the thought process of, I want to find a piece of real estate to the execution of a close of escrow and everything in between, there's partnerships. And so the stronger those partnerships are from raising capital to selling the property and everything in between, I think the better off the people on this call will be. Yeah, Bill, that's a much better answer than I did. Uh, that's exactly right. Uh, those partnerships are, are everything to us uh, in every stage of the game. And, and we have several questions, but I'm going to squeeze in one more for Darcy, and this is about floor plans. Uh, you mentioned floor plans. Can an interior designer help at the front end of a flip as well to, to help make a more functional floor plan? or is it only design staging towards the end? I think that's the difference that people don't understand about interior designers and stagers. So a good interior designer understands layouts and function and flow. And um, so you definitely wanna get them in as early as possible because those are the areas they're gonna be able to help you with and really make a great floor plan because that's the foundation of everything. Yes, Darcy, we, you know, floor plans on every deal, even the kitchens, I mean, one of the greatest you know, uh, points I probably can make here is if you have a kitchen, it, it, common sense is just to put it back, right? Well, we had a 2015 year build house a, a year ago and hey, gosh, they probably knew what they were doing in 2015, right? So the, the, my property managers put the kitchen back how it was without consulting a designer. We walk into the property. It's the dumbest kitchen I think I've ever seen in my life. The microwave is right up against the wall. The, the, the dishwasher didn't open right, you know, and I'm sitting there going, good Lord. So, you know, with floor plans, it, it doesn't have to be the entire floor plan either. It can just be the kitchen, mm -hmm. right? Hey, the space layout. I mean, the designers are at the cutting edge of, of, of everything right now and, and what's trending. And so, hey, you're doing something, you're throwing good money at this, make it be right. And don't just do a put back because you don't want to consult a designer. I mean, we, we, I, I'm right. totally sold on the design thing. So I don't, I don't mean to be pumping your tires too much. Darcy. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Yeah, people want big islands typically. You don't want to see the microwave like right over the range. You know, like we tuck them you know, in the island as like a microwave drawer when we can and, um, you know, single bowl sinks, not like compartmentalized sinks, um, little things like that that are on trend and people get excited about panel ready dishwashers when things are hidden with cabinetry. Um, so yeah, yeah, definitely get your designer's input on that kitchen if nothing else. All right, well, that's great. Um, Bill, this is one final question for you. Um, as Justin just stated, lending is the oldest form of return. Can you please speak to and educate our brokers as to our newly originated pandemic loans? Um, are a product better now versus pre-COVID? And the return, although questionable this minute, are highly profitable looking forward. I don't think lending is better right now than pre-pandemic. I think there was a huge momentum in our space where uh, leverages were getting pushed uh, up and rates were getting pushed down. And I think all of that got corrected and readjusted as we entered into the pandemic. And we're slowly seeing an ease of that. Do I believe it'll come back? 100%, 100%. Do I believe it's gonna be overnight? No, I think it's gonna take some time. And Wall Street's quick to take and very slow to give back. And I think we see that, but demand pool, those opportunities, all of you on this call, continuing to buy properties and beautifying them and selling them, that's ultimately what gets Wall Street to react. It's, we call it here at Civic quality, quantity, consistency. If you do a whole bunch of good loans and you do them over and over and over every month, then you have access to capital that other people don't have. And so, you know, that's really one of my number one jobs is making sure that we have enough capital for all of our investors today, tomorrow, and then in the months to come uh, with the products that they need and, and to be able to serve that. So uh, today, worse than yesterday, tomorrow, better than today. And um, I, I feel like absolutely certain about that. 
Well, great. Thank you so much, Bill. I am going to let you wrap up right now. Um, this is time, and that went by so quickly. Perfect. I'm going to put up on the screen here just for everybody to see how you can find Justin and Darcy if you have more questions for them. Um, and I'll let you I'll let you wrap it up. Yeah, just real quick. I also wanted to say, I don't know if Kendra Rommel's on the call, but we actually got to Darcy through Kendra. Kendra runs a team very successful and one of our very top originators in the company out in Irvine and her and Darcy worked together and that was how we made the introduction. So thank you to Kendra and team for that. And uh, thank you, Darcy, for making your time available to us. There's nobody on this call that can't benefit from where your position is in the marketplace and your breadth of reference. And, and also, Justin, thank you for taking the time. This is the busiest moments of your career right now and you're ta uh, tackling and blocking in a way that you've never had, buying assets in a way that you've never had and, and, and holding up the Alamo. So thank you to Jack, Gina, um, and Liz, thank you for putting this together. And then to all the investors, appreciate you giving us an hour of your time. It's, I mean, we're all, you know, we're all grinding it out. And whether you were in your pajamas in your kitchen or at an office, I'm just as grateful. More to come on this. And I know Gina has captured some of your information, so we'll be, sh be sure to share. I also want to mention really quickly that we had so many questions that we couldn't even get to. So if yours was one of them, please know we'll be reaching out to you. Great. Again, Civic's goal is to provide our partners with information, um, connections to maximize your real estate investments. And so I know for a fact we all learned a lot today. So I appreciate you both, Justin, and Darcy, and Bill, for spending the time with us. Um, for those of you on the call, investors, agents, wholesalers, whoever it may be, when you're ready for your next deal, be sure to contact your Civic account executive and uh, reach out to them or reach out to us via email and we'll make sure that you're, uh, you're handled, um, you know, like Gina mentioned and Bill mentioned, we offer 100% rehab financing, which is a fantastic way to maximize your ROI and your investments, uh, both fix and flip and fix to rent as well. Um, so let us know. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody.